hand over straight to Edmund, uh, who is going to speak about empty promises in relation to crypto assets, notwithstanding how smart the contracts are. There we go. Okay. So, um, I guess some of you will not like um, what I have to say. Maybe it's nonsense, and if it is, I, I really welcome your, your um, pointing out where I go wrong. So, I want to talk a bit about... Um, the idea of putting stuff on the blockchain, trading assets that we care about using blockchain technology and how this interfaces with the law. Now, there are a lot of, so as a lawyer who's interested in blockchain technology, there are a lot of interesting questions that you can um, focus on. We heard um, some of these issues really being, being addressed by Angela, and these are the questions everyone is talking about. Are they uh, token securities, how are they regulated, should they be regulated. Um, what I initially got interested in is this idea, if you look, I think everyone agrees here, if you look at the ICO space, the vast majority of projects are completely crazy, completely insane, and should nobody should actually invest money in those, right? They're completely insane. I think any thinking person looking at it, if you found this room, you should not invest in them, right? So I, I initially... <laughs> Not an investment. Well, I mean, <laughs> people look at it as if it was an investment, right? So, I wanted to write a paper um, on the market for lemon coins and, and really you know, kind of exploring the act of idea of you know, a market where just crazy people do crazy stuff um, attract only products and, and, and projects of the same sort. And then there are other questions about GDPR, is it um, a decentralized autonomous organization and the first, and so on. Um, a lot of interesting questions. But whenever I start thinking about these questions, it feels to me a bit like deciding which color should we paint the stable for our unicorn. Right? We, we worry about very specific questions that are you know, far, far from my perspective down the line without actually stopping and asking ourselves to what extent is, that, is it actually all realistic? But you can ask those questions. They are important questions, important in the sense that they are intellectually stimulating, very interesting questions. But um, I just wanted to step back and look at the whole um, idea of putting stuff on the blockchain and what it means. Also, as any academic, I always worry about nobody caring about what I do. So I go on Google Scholar, where other academics worry about that. And I looked at articles, articles um, on blockchain, by year, you see a tremendous increase. Articles on blockchain law, we also get a lot of those. And I'm a corporate lawyer, and that's what's going on in corporate law. <laughs> so I somehow thought 2018 is kind of the year where I, as a corporate lawyer, should get into blockchain stuff. Okay, so what I want to do is um, look at the status quo, um, try to explain what I, looking at it from the law, see when I look at blockchain technology, how would I describe it um, from a legal perspective? And I'll give you a very narrow definition of what I call a crypto asset, and I completely understand that you may have a different understanding of what it is. I'll try to be precise explaining what I mean by crypto assets. And um, then I'll talk about legal obstacles of creating meaningful crypto assets of the sort I'll be I'm defining, and I'll give you a, a simple, a very simple argument of for for why the law stands in the way of some of these ideas. Based on that, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the law as it stands is just incompatible with the very ambitious promises and projects that we see. Now, this isn't necessarily a big problem as long as legislators are responsive to what we see and responsive to the promises. And we've had that before, I will argue. The law can look at a space like this and then just decide, legislators can decide, we'll adapt our legal system because the benefits of this new world are so great that it's worth actually accommodating it. And um, I'll argue that this is not going to happen in this particular case for um, some technical reasons. Okay, so looking at it, looking at blockchain technology as a lawyer, I would say there are basically two, you could say there are two worlds, there's the physical world and some objects, they just embody value for whatever reason 
And so having this value really correlates very closely with having possession over the item. The item itself um, carries um, the value, and if that's the case, it's very easy to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions because I give you the, the item and you have the value, which is great. No double spending. Well, that's enforced by the law of physics, right? I can't, unfortunately, I can't just, you know, um, create a duplicate object. Um, even in principle, that's impossible. So I can't do that. Um, we don't have to worry about it. And the law has been recognizing this for a long time by giving special status to possession in the law, right? I don't want to get into all the details here, and it differs from country to country, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but every legal system says possession is really important for these physical objects, and we will give special status to them. Then there is the world of intangibles, and I mean intangibles and similar stuff. Stuff where there is a very weak or no correlation between having physical access, possession over something, and the associated legal rights. So that's true, of course, for true intangibles, like rights, claims for payment, stuff like that. But it's also true for stuff like um, you know, r real estate. The fact, first of all, it's not that easy to use this possession uh, metaphor for, for real estate. And then it's just a far weaker correlation. It's not our general, it's our general experience. If you see somebody with a phone, it's probably his or hers. If you see somebody on a piece of land, uh, it's not necessarily a good idea to just assume it belongs to that person. So in this world, we find we have other options. We have the option of doing peer-to-peer -peer transfers, but then we need to trust each other to a certain extent because these things are not helped or we are not we are not aided by possession, so we can assign rights and stuff, but we need some trust. We can instead have something like a central ledger, um, like we have for securities, often, as we have for the land register. And so, then it's, then it's easy. We, don't on, we only need to trust the central record keeper. And then, so, the way I look at blockchain is just, well, that's a third way of doing it. We can have peer-to-peer -peer, um, transactions in these intangibles because the blockchain solves the double spending problem. So we kind of get from the world of intangibles back to what we already have with tangibles, right? So this is just a replication of the physical world. Is that new? Well, of course it's not new. We've had that before. The exact origins are somewhat um, obscure, but probably somewhere in the 12th century, um, uh, Italian merchants said, well, what if we just pretend that this piece of paper is worth something? What if we pretend that this piece of paper embodies some claim and we can have peer-to-peer -peer transactions in intangibles that we will treat like they're transactions intangibles? We just need to do away with the trust stuff. And then we can... Just like I can give you an apple, I can give you a piece of paper. The only problem, of course, is we need to make sure that you having the piece of paper is as valuable as you having the apple. If I give you the apple, you can eat it. If I give you the piece of paper, we need to make sure somehow that this is as good as in the case of the apple. Now, merchants, they decided, well, we can do that. We'll just have, and that you could say is an early version of Cody's law, we can just agree among ourselves that we will do this. We will really follow through. If you have the piece of paper, you have the right. No questions asked. We will not allow you to, to um, claim that you, know, you, you were drunk when it, it happened or whatever it is. If you have the piece of paper, you have the claim. This is called is law in the 12th or maybe 16th century. Right? Some debate about when exactly what happened. Okay. Now... So we have intrinsically worthless objects that can be passed from person to person, and merchants decide to treat them like the real thing. Fantastic. What did the law say? Well, in the beginning, it was a bit skeptical, and said, well, what you're doing here is a nice game, but ultimately we're talking about claims here, and these claims can only be passed in the same, with the same restrictions that existed when you had them, so it's not that easy, and maybe the claim didn't exist at all. So the piece of paper may be a nice hint 
They may give us some idea of whether or not you have to write, but you can call everything into question. That's not a big problem. But it turns out that this idea of you know, um, having pieces of paper that represent those assets was so useful that the law almost everywhere accepted, well, this useful idea is valuable enough for the law to retract from this field almost entirely. And we will only interfere in cases where a signature was forged, for instance. Um, it's clear that the person who claims, you can show that the person who, who makes a claim under this piece of paper wasn't actually honest. They knew it was stolen. They stole it themselves. And so on. So there were some exceptions. But for most cases, we just decided, the law just decided, we'll go with Cody's law with those few exceptions, if you have the piece of paper, you pay, right? So, or you need to pay the person that has the piece of paper. No questions asked unless you can show this, right? Okay, so crypto assets. How do I define crypto assets? Um, I kind of distinguish between two types of blockchain projects. One is what I would call a naked blockchain, where everything that happens, everything that is of interest, actually happens on the blockchain. And this is true for cryptocurrencies, right? They, is, they don't stand in for anything else. If I give you a Bitcoin, you just have the Bitcoin. You, it's, it's, there is nothing behind it. It doesn't really um, represent anything. Um, you could say the same about cash. I mean, cash may be a liability from the central bank's perspective, but it's a liability to pay you 20 pounds. If you have a 20 pound note, that's not particularly meaningful. But it's not only crypt um, cryptocurrencies. You, you could say it's also crypto kitties, right? Crypto kitties. I give, I sell you, a, I transfer crypto kitty. It doesn't stand in for real kitty or anything. All you get is the crypto kitty, right? That's it. So that's what I call the naked blockchain. It doesn't need any link to physical or other reality. Other tokens, and that's what I call the crypto assets. Other tokens, they are meant to somehow convey value from one person to another. And so that would be true for security tokens. Um, and perhaps the more important idea of just putting stuff on the blockchain, putting assets on the blockchain, and all sorts of meaningful smart contracts. Smart contracts that are there and that have the potential to replace normal legal contracts. Right? So that's what I would um, define as uh, crypto assets. And they need to somehow be connected to legal reality. Because what we're trying to do here is have the blockchain reflect the state of the world and it has to be a state of the world that the law agrees with. So, whatever the blockchain says, it can't be in complete disagreement with what the law says, right? Because imagine you have a blockchain that assigns rights, that pretends to assign rights. But we know that the applicable re legal rules don't allow a certain transfer. Then we end up like in medieval times where people transfer papers back and forth. And then the law, the judge steps in and says, I don't care about your nice piece of paper because the fact that you hold it doesn't mean anything to us. Right? So we have to avoid this situation. So they must somehow follow the applicable legal rule. It turns out, unfortunately, no matter how hard you try, the law places limits on what you can agree to. Even if you're a super sophisticated party, you cannot, for instance, represent that um, uh, you know, this is not fraud, and therefore, you know, no matter what you say later on, the, um, the transaction will be valid. Fraud unravels everything, unfortunately. You can't make a representation, a meaningful representation about your corporate capacity or otherwise your capacity, because if you don't have the capacity, this representation is worthless. There are certain agreements that you can, um, uh, you, you can enter into in some countries, but other countries will say, well, we don't accept this particular transaction because it's against the order of the public, and therefore whatever happens in your contract, we will not give any effect to it. There is just no way, and I hope everyone agrees, I'm very happy to do to, discuss this point, there's just no way that you can encode all legal rules about transferring stuff into code. That is just completely, completely 
in, in Postgres. No formal system will ever be able to do that. So you need a system of realignment. If you want to put stuff on the blockchain and you want people to transfer value by transferring tokens, you need a process by which you ensure that the two worlds, the world as reflected by the blockchain and the world as reflected by our current legal system, stay in sync. So, what can you do? You can say, choice of law. We choose a very crypto-friendly jurisdiction, um, and then we just rely on contract law and say, basically, we agree to contract this law. That would be one option. Now, that's not an option, unfortunately. That's not an option that will work, because even if you have a crypto-friendly jurisdiction that would allow you to agree to code this law, because of private international law rules, all other jurisdictions, virtually all major other jurisdictions, would not accept certain types of transfers. So it cannot guarantee the two worlds staying in sync because the code is law jurisdiction. Even if you choose to apply it, it would not be accepted by all major jurisdictions on the basis that, for instance, you cannot agree to you not being defrauded when in fact you are actually being defrauded. What's the alternative? The obvious alternative is, well, you need to keep the state of the world as presented on the blockchain and the legal world in sync. Give the state special read and write terms, right? They get the super key, a super key for the state. The state can always say, I like your blockchain, it's nice what you've been doing, but now we decided that, you know, you, actually, you, are actually, you were married at that point in time, and then um, you got a divorce, and now we will transfer to your husband a certain proportion of your assets. And so you lost the key, I don't believe you, but it doesn't really matter because I, the judge, I have the super key. I'll, I'll make everything work. I'm sure everyone in the blockchain world would be very excited about this idea. <laughs> um, of course, it makes, it makes blockchains completely fun. Yeah. We can have oracles, right? Garbage in, garbage out, right? What is an oracle supposed to do? Is it a court reporter? I mean, that's exactly the same as giving right, a right permission to the state. If I have some idiot sitting in the courtroom who will just parrot what the judge says and somehow implement it on the blockchain, that's the same thing as giving um, right permission to the state. If you say, okay, our fantastic oracle, the court reporter, will make a decision, some decisions, where it's clear that it's oppressive. The state you know, exercises um, its, its, its power monopoly unfairly. Then it will not be implemented. Well, then you just have the new state, and that is the oracle, right? Somebody who decides what's oppressive and what's not. So that's also not an option. What can we do? Well, maybe we can look at the alternative of not doing anything. What will always happen is slowly, over time, the legal world, the world as seen through the lens of the law, and the world as described on the blockchain will have to drift apart. Because every 1,000 transactions, there will be a mistake that you cannot correct, that the law doesn't allow you to correct. Because in fact, I was drunk. In fact, I didn't sign it because my brother knows how to forge my, my signature in the real world, or he knows how to access my device in the virtual world, and so on, and so on. So, if, even if they slowly drift apart, these two worlds, then the value of having stuff on the blockchain will very quickly go away, because people no longer can rely on the status of the blockchain. Yes, okay, it's only a small portion of the assets that are incorrectly recorded, but why would I accept, why would I rely on a ledger which I know has to be wrong, has to be partly wrong, right? So you kind of you have to choose between a centralized token where the state has special the, the super key and can rectify the blockchain, but then you have all the overhead of the blockchain for a centralized system go for the land register, right? Or alternatively, you can be sure that your stuff will not be treated by any sensible person as a representation of the real thing. Because people know what you have here is a faulty record very likely faulty record of the legal world. And the longer you wait, the more faults there will be in there, and very quickly nobody has to rely on it. 
you could say, we would ob you, you could object to that and say, but you know, artificial intelligence will solve this. Uh, of course not, right? This is. This is I hope nobody would, would actually make this objection. This is crazy and stupid. Um, <laughs> of course, the law could just embrace blockchain technology. The law could say, we understand your problems. We understand these problems with syncing the two worlds. And we understand that you know, giving the state special permission is not very popular with you guys and probably not the best idea. Maybe we can just endorse perhaps for certain assets in certain situations, we can endorse, the law can endorse Cody's law. If you have the token, you have it. Everything that is on the blockchain is by definition what the law will acknowledge. So we do away with the exceptions, the normal exception we have in the world of you know, negotiable instruments and so on. And we just have to make sure that we understand even small exceptions could actually be very damaging to the project. Will we do that? Well, that depends on costs and benefits. We have, to a certain extent, you could say, we have done something similar in the, um, the area of finance, where we say there's, um, for instance, in the EU, the Settlement Finality Directive, which basically says, yeah, we uh, care all very deeply about insolvency laws, and sometimes it's unfair and last-minute payments and so on, but our financial system would be a complete mess if you could go back after a financial institution goes into um, some sort of liquidation and then second-guess transactions that were made in the last two months or so. Therefore, we say we understand that sometimes the results will not be what we would usually want the result to be. But in this particular case, we will just say, you said so, this is final. Nothing will happen to your settlement. It doesn't matter whether you were already insolvent when you made, and so on. Why? Because the benefits outweigh the cost, right? So maybe that's, that can be here too. Now, this really goes into the idea of smart contracts. How much money can you save? How more efficient can the world be when you have a blockchain world with smart contracts, and so on? And I think Noam Chomsky says it best when he kind of describes how there's a trade-off between complexity and, 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 and precision and usefulness. Everything you can code isn't going to be very important. It's a big shocker for non-lawyers, but lawyers do not sit around and sue other people for obligations that are crystal clear. This is just not a job. Nobody does that. Right? So everything that you can actually encode in this very, very simple language that is used in smart contracts these are only the simplest of promises. And these, over those simple promises, nobody fights. Nobody just decides not to pay, even though they have the money and there's, it's crystal clear that there's an obligation. But that doesn't happen. People fight over stuff that you simply cannot, I would argue, put, on, um, put into the language of, of code. So you could say maybe you know, some of the ledgers, we can replace some of the ledgers. So who are we cutting out? We're cutting out the middleman. But it turns out we're cutting out the really, really efficient, the very boring middleman, right? We can have a ledger. Look at the land register. They have 5.5 trillion on the ledger. And they have a turnover of less than 0.006% of the asset value per year. And that includes a lot of services that you couldn't replace on the blockchain, plus um, a healthy dividend of 50 million or so to um, to the taxpayer, or the largest asset um, custodian, Bank of New York Mellon, 0 0.03 of total re revenue in their custodian business. So, I'm just, I'm not saying these are fantastic solutions, I'm just saying like, the margin for improvement is tiny, right? We are in these simplistic areas, we are so efficient already. It's not going to happen. You are not going to convince anyone that we should change the law to allow these huge promises of the blockchain. So I, I would say, why do the blockchain promises always sound so great? They sound so great, I would argue, because they use the wrong comparator. It's always, not always, but it's very often the same. You say, let's assume we switch everyone to the blockchain, then it's much more efficient than we have now. Well, of course that is true. The problem is that switching everyone to anything 
is very difficult. I'm absolutely sure that if you could switch every bank on the planet to Game Boys, the IT system would work better because you would have a very simple, very old, very stupid, <laughs> highly predictable, compatible, reliable system around the world. Should we, should we kind of migrate the financial system on Game Boys? Of course not, that's stupid. It's better than what we have now. But once you assume that you can make the switch, then please compare it with all other worlds where you can make everyone switch. Now, if you can everyone switch, I challenge people to find real use cases, conditional upon the entire industry changing on the same day without friction to the new system. Blockchain, the best, uh, where blockchain is the best solution. Recently read, you know, EU saying we could have blockchain for, um, for fighting fraud in second car sales. What we have to do is the odometers on cars will be re replaced with smart instruments that, that you know, have something in the blockchain that's, that's signed. And are they completely insane? If I can have a smart odometer in every car, of course, then it's hard to, to cheat. But I could do a million different things, like them tweeting out a hash of their... What, I mean, it's ridiculous to say, in this world, it's better. Of course, it's better, because it's better after having switched everything. So that, that isn't really convincing. So is the law going to change in order to accommodate, as I would argue is necessary? I think cost-benefit analysis shows very unlikely. History shows it's unlikely with um, bills and, and negotiable instruments. Generally, we always kept the law, always kept exceptions, as it should be, right? I mean, in a democracy, the law should be able to change its mind. The law should be able to say, now, there are certain things that we don't want to allow to happen. Okay, so, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm still doubting. I'm not entirely sure what my opinion is. Um, in, in conclusion, my argument is, if you want a real, an economy that is compatible with, you know, putting stuff on the blockchain, right, then this is incompatible with the legal system we have in virtually all countries. I can't think of any country where it isn't. Because the benefits that moving to a blockchain world, um, the benefits that this would offer, are tiny compared to um, this big leap that we would expect from the law. I just doubt that any legal system will adapt in this particular way. And I acknowledge, and that is the last thing I'll say, I acknowledge that this is just not applicable. None of these arguments are applicable to real, true cryptocurrencies and equally to crypto kitties. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll open the floor for comments, questions, please.